Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me this Sunday. Please bear with me as usual while I get set up. Oh, there we go. Oh, kind of figured out how to do this so much faster. Um, while I'm getting set up, why don't you guys tell me where you're tuning in from, um, what you've been up to in the last week. And also do let me know um, if you can actually hear me because it's raining in um, Kachar Forest Retreat at the moment in Bentong, Pahang, Malaysia. Um, so I don't know, might be messing with the audio. Oh my god, it's actually been raining pretty consistently for the last 48 hours. I think like with like a 3-4 hour break here and there. Um, but it's been raining uh, non-stop. Um, so if you guys are out on the roads, please drive safely, please be careful. I've been seeing a lot of reports about accidents um, going on. Good morning, Joyce. Good morning, Kok Lian. Uh, yeah. So yeah, if you guys are out on the roads, please, please be careful, all right? Um, because I hate to sound like a weather person, but conditions are treacherous out there. Um, what's happened? Uh, went out for a very short uh, bike ride with one of our, well, with the Dharma brother this morning, uh, Liu. And um, yeah, so it was a nice break because I haven't been outdoors very much in the last week. So <laughs> I wanted to take the opportunity while well, there was some nice weather to go out. But um, oh, let's see. Morning, David. Good morning, Esther. Good morning, Penny. Good morning, Sukhvan. Uh, so yeah. Um, good morning, Kinho. Uh, went out for a short ride with uh, Liu this morning. And um, just to let you guys know, today's video, today's Sunday sharing is actually going to be the last Sunday sharing of the year. Um, we're going to take a break and then resume in the new year. So keep your eyes peeled for announcements about when we will be resuming. If you do have any ideas for content or topics that you would like us to cover, um, things that you would like to see, um, questions that you would like to ask, um, send us a message on the Kachara Facebook fan page and then we will compile everything, go through everything and then come up with something that actually um, suits you guys, alright? Uh, unlike Rinpoche, we don't have the clairvoyance to uh, ascertain what it is that people need at that moment in time. Rinpoche had this very special quality about being able to give a talk um, or share information exactly just as when you need it. And um, Rinpoche would always speak, always talk based on the karma of the audience, what it is that they needed to hear. Um, I can tell you for a fact that I don't have that special quality or that special ability. So um, I need you guys to tell me because I can't read your minds, all right? So if you guys have any ideas for content that you would like to see, please let me know, all right? Um, and uh, I don't know if you heard, but our biography for Rinpoche's, uh, Rinpoche's biography is going to be published so if you would like to get involved with that and um, help us to make that possible, um, let me know and I will shoot the details over to you. And if you haven't already done so, please do make your Chinese New Year offerings, all right? So um, as usual, before we get started this week, I'm going to do a short prayer to ascribe the source of the information that um, will be shared during today's sharing. All right, so I go for refuge in my Lama, from whom I've received these teachings. I go for refuge in the lineage lamas from whom my lama has received these teachings. Alright, so uh, thank you very much for joining me this week, our last week, week 28, which makes it seven months. You guys really have stamina, alright? So, um, before I get started on today's topic, I'm just going to do a quick recap on what we covered last week. And last week, I answered a question that someone had asked, um, which is how I knew I wanted to be a nun. And so in brief, I answered saying that um, as a preface, if you love Buddhism, you don't have to become a nun or a monk in order to practice Buddhism. You can still practice Buddhism as a lay practitioner. And in fact, that is something that Rinpoche had recommended to a lot of us because um, there are responsibilities that, and decisions that we've made that we have to take responsibility for um, prior to meeting Buddhism. So Rinpoche said, if you love Buddhism, if you love the Dharma, and if you find that the Dharma is beneficial to your life, um, apply it 
stay as you are, but become better, transform, apply the Dharma, become kinder, become more generous, become less angry, and so on. All right. Um, but as for myself, I, I answered by saying that I actually always knew that I wanted to be a nun, basically for as long as I can remember. Um, I've known since I was 14 that I didn't want children. I made my first request to Rinpoche when I was 16 to be a nun. Then another request when I was in my early 20s, and then my third request, which Rinpoche finally accepted when I was in my late, thir- uh, late 20s. All right, so um, it's something that I've always known pretty much that I wanted to do and although things may have like kind of like you know made me think about postponing it into the future for example when I was in a four-year relationship with someone um, and we were thinking about getting married um, I did think well maybe I'll become a nun but when I'm much much older so it it was always still there at the back of my mind Um, personally I've always found it strange um, or I've I've always wondered why. I've always questioned why people um, say that you must have children or you must have kids or you must have and you must do certain things. And I've always wondered, who is it that's telling me I must do this? Um, Why must I do this? So there were things that, you know, people were telling me that I have to do, which I didn't really see the reasoning for. Um, So I was already questioning from a young age why I must do certain things. And... um, when I looked around and I looked at people who did the things that everybody told them they must do, um, I saw that there is a lot of suffering. Um, people who say that they must get rich, but then they are very insecure about losing their wealth or they are very desirous of gaining more wealth or people who say that they must be beautiful, they must be skinny and then becoming very insecure about maintaining or retaining their looks um, or people feeling very insecure about the way that they look and trying all the time to look better, not being comfortable with who they are. Um, people who say that, um, you know, I, I must get married, but then expressing um, a lot of problems with their partners, um, whether it's insecurity about keeping the partner or whether it's directing a lot of energy to keeping a partner or whether it's feeling lonely because they can't find a partner, but they've been told they must have one. Right? So there's... I, I've observed that there was a lot of suffering in people's drive or people's push in order to achieve the things that they were told they must do. And as I mentioned last week, I'm not saying that you know people who have made these decisions or whatever are wrong or bad or anything like that. No one is bad for making these decisions. Um, I'm just saying that for myself and what it is that I wanted to accomplish or achieve in this life, um, those decisions did not match what it is that I wanted for myself. So um, when people told me I must do certain things, I was like, why must I? And why must I do it when um, I don't see that it has brought any more or any less happiness to a person? Um, and I also thought if I'm going to live for 70, 80 years, um, and I'm going to go through all of the ups and downs and all of the emotional volatility and upheaval and everything, and all of the suffering for these 80 years, if I have to go through it because I'm alive, um, what am I going through it for? Am I going through it for a result at the end of my life? You know, um, and I wanted to go through all of that suffering, that pain and everything for a reason. Now you might be thinking, oh, did you have this idea spontaneously? Half, half. I can't remember when I first started thinking about it. Um, because I was very, very young when my grandmother taught me how to recite the refuge prayer. And she was already giving me Dharma books. They were comics, so I didn't actually realize that they were Dharma books. But it was really starting from a young age. And then when I got older then, and I met Ramshi, then it all, it all basically came together. All right, so um, I saw how this suffering was happening. Then I saw how this suffering was self-created. And I saw how people really wanted to find a way to get out of this type of discontent, this kind of dissatisfaction and this kind of unhappiness, find a solution for this unhappiness. And I realized I don't have to make the same decisions um, and create that unhappiness for myself if I don't have to. Right? So um, last week I also shared that just because I decided from a young age that I wanted to seek ordination doesn't mean that everything went smoothly, doesn't mean that everything was rosy. I mentioned last week that when, I, when my third request was accepted, 
although my parents knew that I already wanted to become a nun for a very long time, they were not accepting of my decision. They weren't happy and that, in fact, my mother didn't talk to me for three months. Um, I mentioned that um, it doesn't mean that my mind is totally settled in the sense that once I made the request and was accepted that I don't still fantasize about, you know, like, what if. So what if I was not to do this and I was to go and get married? What if I didn't do this and I was go to go and get a normal job? What if I didn't do this and I was to go and, you know, do something else? So basically a lot of what if scenarios. But what I had, I was very, very lucky to have was Ramachi's guidance. And Ramachi's guidance to... Um, motivate me, compel me, to direct me, to um, expand that thought. So instead of just sticking to what if, it was what if I do this and then what? So what if I get married and then what? What if I pursue a career and then what? And so every time I go to the and then what portion of that meditation that Rinpoche, um always encourages us to do, I couldn't find a good reason, I couldn't find a good answer to that. Um, because I know that at the end of my life, if I can't look back and think, well, I did that for this person, I did that to benefit this person, I will be full of regret. I, I know that I will be full of regret. So that question of and then what always stops me from exploring the what if question any further or any more tangibly. All right. So um, I also brought up last week that ordination isn't for everyone and that when people seek ordination, oftentimes... Um, it's done with a lot of expectation. And this is something that Rinpoche was very, very kind to make us very aware of, was that when we seek ordination, seek it without a sense of expectation. We seek, many people seek ordination with the expectation that once they've made this request, that everything's going to be okay, that automatically they will get support, automatically they will get friends, automatically they will get respect, automatically um, their spiritual pro uh, practice will you know, like zoom ahead and then it will increase exponentially. And going into ordination or requesting ordination with expectations is not very beneficial to our practice. All right? Because your problems don't disappear and your life doesn't completely change just because you have requested to become ordained. In fact, in today's times in this day and age, once you've requested ordination and you have made your intention known, most of the time, you don't get very much support. Most of the, most of the time, you're told you're crazy. Um, you get people second-guessing you. You get people doubting you. You get people questioning you. You get people telling you that you've wasted your life. Um, you get people telling you that um, you are being ungrateful to your parents. You're, you get people telling you that... Um, you're much better off doing other things. Um, you get people telling you that you're a loser and that you can't make it in life and that's why you're escaping to become a monk or a nun. And when people tell me that I used to get very worked up, I'd be like, no, hey, hang on. I'm not a loser. I made this choice. I chose to do this. Um, and then after a while, I realized that people express these doubts and people express all of this information because they don't know any better. People ask these questions because they don't know any better. Maybe, they are, maybe it is their intention to be offensive, but I don't have to take it as being offensive. I can use it as an opportunity to educate someone. All right? But my point here is that just because you are seeking ordination or you have made your intention known, it, is, it, it will not be helpful to you if you were to do it with a sense of expectation. So like anything else in life, it is very good to remove the expectation to remove the projections from that request from that situation, all right? So, as I'm talking about this, and as I was talking about this last week, um, the thought came to mind that actually the next topic, the next question, the next subject that I would like to cover is the subject of raising nice children or the subject of being there for our children in the right way, which is actually the title of a blog post that Rinpoche has previously composed is um, being there for our children or being there for kids in the right way. Um, why did I come up with this subject? Why did I come up with this um, topic? I am extremely fortunate. I know that I'm extremely fortunate to have met Rinpoche at 
a young age, to have met Rinchi when I was 11. I know that I'm extremely fortunate to have had parents who are generally supportive of what it is that I wanted to do. And I'll get into that later. Um, but I know that not everyone is in that position. And um, also, I see a lot of people around and I see people um, repeating, reenacting, engaging and uh, manifesting the same kind of traumas that they experienced when they were kids. And they are impressing these traumas, these experiences, um, these habituations on their own children. And when I look back on my own childhood, I also see that that was the experience that I went through. All right? So before I get into any more details on today's talk, um, before I continue, I actually do want to thank the sponsor of... Um, today's talk, the last sharing of 2020, um, who wishes to remain anonymous, but would like to dedicate their contribution towards the swift removal of all obstacles to enable the return of Rumuchi's incarnation to Kachar Force Retreat. All right. So thank you very much for your um, support of this sharing. And um, if you wish to sponsor a sharing, if you wish to sponsor a talk, there is a link in the description section of this video. So please do click on it because as I mentioned every week, uh, your support does keep does help us to keep making these programs available to everyone. All right, so um, like I mentioned, I was very lucky in the sense that my parents met Rinpoche when I was very young. So Rinpoche had, thankfully, <laughs> had a very huge influence on my life as I was growing up. And um, when I got older, when I was able to join Kachar full time, um, Rinpoche, I'm so thankful that Rinpoche was able to work on many of the qualities and habits that I picked up or that I developed as a child um, and then I reinforced as a young adult because if I had not had that opportunity with Rinpoche, I know for a fact that I would have been much worse. All right? um, and as a preface before I go into this, I'm going to point out that this is not a diatribe um, against my parents. This is not a criticism of how they raised me. Um, this is recognition that at the age of 34, um, many things happened um, that led to a lot of difficulty in my later years, um, led to difficult interpersonal relationships, interactions with people, and um, caused my relationships with people to suffer, caused suffering to other people, and caused myself to suffer. All right, so what I'm sharing today are things that Rinpoche shared with me um, and showed me so that we can self-examine and see what it is that we are engaging in ourselves that is causing suffering to other people around us and in the case of parents, which is having an impact on our kids. All right. So why talk about this? And you guys might be, must be thinking, and you're very right to think, um, Pastor Jinai, you don't have any children, so why are you talking about this? And you are right, I don't have kids. Uh, so, who am I to talk about it? I may not have children, but I was a child once. And I can tell you, um, with the benefit of a lot of hindsight, and with the benefit of understanding how my actions now um, may damage or cause suffering to other people, um, I can tell you now what I would have liked. Um, what would have created less suffering for me and other people over the years. Um, I can also tell you from the perspective of someone who spent a lot of time with Rinpoche, <sighs> thankfully, um, from a very young age and saw an example of this perfect person with these incredible qualities that I respect tremendously. Um, and if you who are watching, be an intelligent person, if you admire Rinpoche and you observe these qualities um, about Rinpoche that lead you to have such admiration and respect for this person, um, why not try to emulate those qualities for yourself and for your children and for other people around you? All right? So, um, on that note, you might also be thinking, well, you as the listener, as the viewer, you might be thinking, oh, I don't have kids, so um, this sharing doesn't apply to me. But the thing is, you don't need to have kids to appreciate and to recognize 
that these are qualities that will be beneficial to your life anyway and that will be beneficial to other people around you anyway. For example, you may not have children, but um, do you have nieces and nephews? Do you have close friends who have children? Do you have neighbours with kids? Do you have kids in your neighbourhood? Um, these are all people from a young age who will be observing adults around them and taking in all of this information. You also need to realise, we also need to realise that we don't live in a bubble, we don't live in a vacuum. And we don't live in a situation whereby there's no one around us. And so, whatever it is, whether there are children around us or not, um, this is about making ourselves, guiding ourselves to becoming a decent human being, basically. Um, so that we can affect positive change around us. All right. So, um, don't you find a lot of times when you are talking to someone, all right, or in this case when you're disciplining your children, and you end up imitating, unconsciously, subconsciously imitating a lot of the actions and words that your parents used to do. I know this because um, when I first started driving, um, my brother used to say like, oh my god, you drive like mum. Like to that extent where even the way I drive, even the way I handle a car is like my mother. Um, there were times when I told my sister off when I was younger and my sister would turn to me and like she would like snap at me and be like, you sound just like mum. And um, that happened quite a lot when I was younger. So I, it, it took me aback. You know, I was like, oh, I did not realise that so many things that I observed, so many things that I went through as a child um, made such an impact on my mind, made such an impact on my behaviour to the point that I was finding the same things. Um, I, I was observing, picking out the same things as my parents because that is what I saw them do. And I was picking up the same things, I was commenting on the same things because that is what I saw them do. All right. Um, when I talk about my childhood and everything, I, I want to also say, okay, it wasn't all bad, all right? Like comparatively to a lot of people, I had a very, very nice childhood, okay? <laughs> so I'm going to put that out there right now. Um, my parents did impart, um, did teach me some very positive habits. Um, for example, um, they taught me to think fast, think on my feet. Um, they taught me to enjoy giving things to people um, and to take pleasure and to find pleasure in doing that. Um, they taught me to have a strong work ethic um, and to be totally okay with, you know, working very, very, very hard. Um, they taught me to try and deliver good work, to deliver work that's free from mistakes. My mom used to tell me, why do things in a half past six way? Um, and one thing that I am grateful for is that they fostered and they encouraged me to be, um, they, they fostered this sense of activism in me and to speak up, to speak up when I see something wrong, when I see some, something bad happening, to not stay quiet, to not stay silent. Um, they, did ne they never told me to shut up. They never told me to keep quiet. They never told me to not speak. Whenever I saw something wrong and I wanted to do something about it, they were always supportive. So there are these things that my parents did teach me, which I'm very grateful for now that I'm older. At the same time, um, there were other less positive qualities that I picked up from observation. Um, for example, I can be very critical. Um, I can find it very hard to admit that I'm wrong. Uh, I have a tendency to tie my self-esteem to how perfectly I do things. And so if I don't do things perfectly the first time or the second time or the third time, then I feel like there's something wrong with me or that I could have done something better or that I missed, on, missed out on something. And so there, it, it, it's, it's a reflection on me somehow. Um, sometimes I have a tendency to avoid facing uh, certain emotions or certain uh, situations. So those are some of the qualities that I developed or habits I developed over the years as a result of observing it in my parents. The first thing that all of us need to recognize and need to realize is that children are aware of what's happening around them long before we think that they are, or long before we assume that they are. Um, for example, there is a picture of me, like when I'm like one or two, and I'm holding a balloon. And um, I remember very well the 
room that that picture was taken in. I remember very well what the balloon felt like. I remember very well um, how I felt in that moment. I remember what colour the room was, who was around me, where that room was. I remember that situation very, very well. I remember times when, um, like during Chinese New Year and leaving my grandparents' house, you know, to go and visit relatives, how incredibly hot it was in the car. I remember how the car smelled. I remember who was in the car. I remember what I was wearing. I remember what was said. Um, so children are observing things and picking things up from a very, very young age. Even before we realise um, that they're doing these things. Even if they can't verbalise it, they are still absorbing and they're still observing. I can tell you from a very young age that I knew that my mother was an extremely angry and angersome person, that she was very, she was triggered very easily, um, that things as simple as closing the door too loudly would result in a scolding and a slap from her. You know, so from a young age, I remember being on tenter hooks with her quite often. Um, my siblings and I. So I remember this. I also remember equally that after she met Rumichi, and after, she, after the first time she met Rumichi, the weight that was lifted off her shoulders and how she was a much happier person, that change was absolutely discernible when I was young. To the point where after she came back from the pilgrimage, I thought, who possessed my mother? Like, who is this person that came back from India? because she was a completely different person, and I was young. So, children do observe, do understand, and do absorb these things. The second thing is, we also need to think about a child's environment. Especially when they're younger, a child spends the majority of their time at home or at school. And the first person that they are taught to look up to is their parents. They are taught that everything that their parents do is unquestionable. They are taught that their parents are infallible, that their parents are flawless, and they are taught that their parents are perfect. And it may not necessarily be their parents who are telling them this, like not, their parents are not saying, well, don't question me. It may not be that, but it could be society, it could be people around children who are giving that impression to the kids that your parents are infallible and flawless and perfect. All right? So when you're in that environment, what happens is everything that the parent does, every time the parent reacts, everything the parent says and so on, from a young age, the child already thinks that is the right way of doing things. Why? Because they don't have any other examples. The example that they have in front of them is basically their parents or the teachers, right? So being that examples are in such limited supply at that age, it is therefore very, very important for us to set a good example for kids around us. So, why bother um, applying Dharma? Why bother transforming? Why bother listening to this sharing if you don't have kids? If you do have kids, applying Dharma and transforming, doing your best to transform, practicing. All right, I want to emphasize this word practicing because we always forget that when we do Dharma practice, it doesn't mean that we're perfect. It means that we are still trying to get, that, get to that stage where we have achieved a certain realization, achieved a quality. We are still trying, hence the word practice. All right? So why bother applying Dharma? Why bother practicing and transforming? Because, even it, it, because if you do have children, by transforming, by working on certain qualities of ours, we are raising our kids to be responsible people, to be responsible citizens. What Rimichi always told us is that we can leave all the money in the world to our kids, but if our children do not have the karma to keep it, they will lose it anyway. So you can be Bill Gates and leave billions of dollars to your children, which he's not doing. Um, but if your children don't have the karma to keep that money, there's no way that they're going to be able to keep it. Rimichi actually said um, that there's a Chinese saying that um, wealth doesn't last beyond three generations. And so Rumi said, why is that? The saying is that wealth doesn't last beyond three generations because the karma for it to last has run out. The karma for it to be there has run out. All right? So instead 
of giving fish to your children, why not teach them to fish? Now, if you don't have kids, why bother listening to this sharing? Why bother applying Dharma? Why bother practicing? Why bother transforming? Ultimately, you yourself become a nicer person. If you are a parent, you become a nicer person. If you are not a parent, you become a nicer person. If you are a parent, actually, you are lucky in the sense that you can use that sense of responsibility towards your kids to fuel your own spiritual practice, to fuel your own improvement. Why? Because you want to do it because you love your kids. You also put yourself in a position where you end up being able to let go of a lot of things that are causing you suffering. In the last few months um, of Ramachi's life, I was very, very fortunate to have a lot of conversations with Ramachi where Rinpoche basically helped me analyze and helped me go very deep into the childhood that I had, the experiences that I had, and how that led to a lot of, I say, trauma um, that has led me to behave in the way that I do today. So in that process of meditating that was being guided by Rinpoche, um, I was able to see where a lot of the behaviours that I developed came from. And so as a parent, as a person, you get an understanding of why are you angry? Um, why do you react in a certain way when your child does something? Why do you use certain words when your child does something? Um, as a person, why are you angry? Why, do you, um, why are you hypersensitive? about certain people behaving in a certain way? Why are you hypersensitive about some certain people talking to you in a certain way? Why are you hypersensitive about you know, um, people in the workplace um, doing their job or not doing their job as well as you think that they could be? Um, why are you sensitive about your friends um, leaving you out of an outing and so on? So when we study Dharma, when we apply Dharma when we meditate, it gives us an opportunity to let go of a lot of situations and experiences that we had when we were younger, which continue to cause us suffering, which we don't realize oftentimes is causing us suffering. There are many learned behaviors and traumas that we experienced in the past that we continue to carry on now. And in the case of parents, it's those behaviors and traumas which are now affecting our children. So as a parent, as someone who may be in a position of responsibility um, where we have kids looking at us, wouldn't it be nice if we are able to break the cycle for them so that they don't pick up these same experiences that we had as we were children and then carry it on to the next generation? All right. So what am I speaking on the basis of? Since I don't have kids, right? Why am I speaking on the basis of? Um, I'm speaking on the basis of advice that Rinpoche has given me throughout the years and the habits that Rinpoche has spent a tremendous amount of time helping me to unpack. Um, and speaking on the basis of the teachings that I've received and the qualities um, that Rinpoche taught me to value, um, I'm speaking on the basis of having contemplated on my own childhood um, and the qualities that I was not taught um, or given the opportunity to develop, I'm speaking on the basis of advice that I've witnessed Rinpoche giving to other people. And I'm speaking on the basis of the qualities that I observed in Rinpoche that made me love and respect and admire Rinpoche. All right, so how can we be there for children in the right way? How can we, quote unquote, raise nice kids? The most important aspect, most important quality that Rinpoche always emphasised and always told us to do was to focus out. Focus out on other people and focus on doing things for them and not for you. Oftentimes, we do things that we think are for someone else, but somehow, somewhere, some level of selfishness manages to creep in. Um, for example, 
do we send our kids to private school because it's very good for them and they will get a good education or because it reflects on us that when we are with our group of mummies and daddies or whatever that we can say oh did you know that my kid is in this and this school right so are we sending our kids to private school for them purely for them or because we can get some kind of kudos or pat on the back you know well done for being able to afford to send our children to such and such private school do we dress our children nicely because um, there is a lesson to be taught about making good first impressions or because it's a reflection on us. Ayah, you see that child, so messy, so dirty. The parents didn't teach him well. Oh, so then that, that fear of us being that parent who didn't teach the child well compels us to dress our child nicely. So, are we doing things purely for someone else or because there is some level of selfishness still involved in our decision? So what Rinpoche always emphasized was focus out. We have to realize that whenever we make a decision as a child or as an adult, as an adult dealing with a child or as an adult dealing with other adults, that it's not always about us and that it's about them, it's about someone else too. All right? That as a parent with a child, whatever decisions we make, or whatever decisions that are made, I can't say we because I'm not one of, I'm not a parent. So whatever decisions are made, um, the child has to live with the repercussions and the consequences long after the parent is gone. And that is something that my parents always told me when I was a kid. Make sure you learn this because when I'm gone, you're going to have to be able to do this for yourself. All right. That is a lesson that we need to apply to both positive and destructive qualities. So think, how many things are there that our parents did that we also do now? Whether it's to our own children or to other people. How did our parents' own childhood impact their lives that then had an impact on your life as a result of the qualities and habits that they developed as children? Therefore, how are we impacting our own kids now by creating the childhood that they're going through? Did we enjoy our experience as children? Or did our parents, who are very kind, stumble sometimes? Did they make mistakes sometimes that led to repercussions that we as adults are dealing with now? Now, I want to say now is not the time for us to judge our parents as being good or bad, all right? Ultimately, whatever it is, whatever your parents did to you, Rumshi always told us, Buddhism always told us, always tells us that our parents have been extremely kind to us. Why? Because our parents are the reason why we have this human body now to be able to learn, perceive, understand, contemplate on and practice the Dharma. Ultimately, whatever it is our parents have done to us, for us, we have this human body because of them. All right, so we have to be grateful to them no matter what it is. So now isn't the time to judge our parents as being good or bad because as I've emphasized so many times in the past, no one is inherently, no one is an inherently good or bad person. All right? Remember that your parents are fallible, that they did the best that they could for you based on what they knew and based on how and what they knew. All right? Um, but use this as an opportunity to analyze what it is about your childhood um, that you would have wanted to be different, what it is about your childhood had an impact on you, um, and therefore what kind of childhood and what kind of life you want for your own kids and make a decision to be different. And that's why I said before, if you have kids, use them as motivation as fuel for your own spiritual practice, for your own transformation, to apply the teachings that Rinpoche has taught all of us. How can you make a decision to be different? One very, very important thing, which I've seen so many times, um, that many people struggle with, is doing our best to avoid hypocrisy. What does it mean to do our best to avoid hypocrisy? Do what you say. As a child, 
Weren't there times when you went up to your parents and you said, but you said that if I do this, 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 I will get that. But you said if I get an A in my exam, I will get this present. And weren't there times when your parents turned to you and said, yeah, well, I changed my mind. Weren't there times when your parents said that? Aren't there times when you have seen people um, who espouse to be a certain way, who, you know, talk about the benefits of certain qualities, but are still struggling to emulate and to practice those qualities themselves. So if we are constantly not doing what it is that we say is good or what we say people should do, the result is over time, how can anyone trust what it is that we're going to say? Each time we say something, each time we promise something and we don't do it, that is one mark. That is one mark on a person's mind where after a while, their trust in us is eroded. Children may not be able to verbalize hypocrisy. They may not be able to say, hey, you're being hypocritical, but they can notice it. Children can notice hypocrisy and children can react to it. They can react to it either by absorbing and thinking that it's an acceptable way of behaving or they can react to it by thinking there's something wrong about this situation and they can react to it by doubting everything it is that the parent does or says. Yeah, but you know, last time mom said that, but she didn't really mean it. She changed the mind later. Can we really believe her this time? Yeah, you know, last time dad said that we were going to do this, 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 and then it t- didn't turn out to be the case. So now that he says this, can we really believe him? All right, so do what it is that you're going, do what it is that you say you're going to do. Practice what you preach. If you're going to talk Dharma to your children, make sure that you are practicing what you tell them. Even if it's extremely hard to do it, even if it's very, very hard to keep your promise, make sure that your child sees you doing what it is that you say so that they know that you always mean what you say. I know so many parents and so many children um, who had very, very bad relationships with one another um, as they were growing up together because they knew that every time their parents talk Dharma, their parents were not really practicing. So why talk to me about the benefits of Dharma if you're not going to practice yourself? Why follow? Why listen? Why subscribe to the teachings if you don't believe in the teachings yourself? So... The important, if you really do love Dharma, if you really do believe in the benefits of Dharma, if you really do want your kids to come into Dharma, your kids need to see that you are doing what you say, that you're practicing what you preach. All right? That means being honest with yourself and being honest with them. Being honest with yourself means being honest with yourself about the qualities that you have, which are positive for your children and for others, as well as being honest with yourself about the qualities which you have which are harming your children and harming other people around you. Why? We find it so difficult to be honest because of the examples that we observed as we were growing up. If we want our children to be honest effortlessly, we need to show them that it's okay to be honest um, with ourselves and with other people around us. Because children can tell when someone is lying. They can tell. They can tell when somebody is dishonest. They can tell when somebody is sneaky. They can tell when somebody is being manipulative. Rimichi was the epitome, was the perfect example of being honest, even if that honesty would make Rimichi look bad or put Rimichi at a disadvantage. Um, Rimichi would... Okay, very clear example. Rimichi was extremely honest with money. If anyone ever went to do something for Rimichi, Rimichi would insist that the person's reimbursed immediately. Like no second delay, like instantly. As soon as you get back, you're reimbursed immediately. Um, Rimichi was very, very, very clear, extremely clear that if somebody offers something for a specific purpose, that offering can be only be used for that purpose. That's it. Rimichi was honest to that, to that point. So even if, for example, there was a project that needed some support, needed some help, and it was 
it would have been convenient to direct the offering somewhere else, Rinpoche would refuse to do it. Why? Because that person trusted Rinpoche to make the offering for that particular purpose and so the offering is going to go to that purpose and Rinpoche was very, very respectful of that person's trust. So even if it put Rinpoche at a disadvantage, even if it caused Rinpoche to struggle, even if it made Rinpoche look bad, Rinpoche would still insist on being completely honest. All right? Why should we be honest? Why should we avoid hypocrisy? Why should we focus out? Because all of these things are about us being kind. Now, when I was a child, I was very lucky because um, my parents used to take us to this temple, this very old temple. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. It's on Jalan Ampang. Um, they would take us there every weekend. Back then, we lived in Kiel Plaza, so it wasn't so far away. So they would take us to this um, uh, temple on Jalan Ampang every single weekend. And then they would... The thing that like, I love to do, the thing that my siblings and I love to do was we love to give money to the homeless people. So every single weekend, my parents would take us to the temple to pray to Kuan Ying, whom my dad introduced to me as my godmother. And then um, after that, when we were leaving the temple, my parents would let us give money to the beggars and to the homeless people outside. Um, they knew that we enjoyed doing it and they would take us to the temple for the specific purpose of doing that. They were very supportive of it. They would give us money and they would prepare um, one ringgit coins so that we would be able to give more easily. That experience made a huge impression on me as a child. It showed me that it's okay to be generous it showed me that it's okay to be kind. Um, it's, it showed me that it's okay to look to other people who have less and to give to them. And it showed me that it's okay to go without so that someone else doesn't have to suffer. That it's okay for me to not enjoy something so that somebody else suffers less. I was very fortunate in that way to have that example, to have that support and encouragement from my parents from that age. And then when I got older, I saw Rinpoche always giving things to people without agenda. Even people who hate Rinpoche, even people who criticize Rinpoche, um, Rinpoche would still help them. Rinpoche would still find some way of helping them. There were people who would be extremely hateful and critical and harmful to Rinpoche, but if Rinpoche heard that somebody that they loved was sick or someone that they loved, for example, had cancer or so on, Rinpoche would still find some way of helping them by giving them advice in another, in a, in a, by another avenue. Rinpoche would still do prayers for them. Rinpoche would still sponsor pujas for them. I saw, that, I saw Rinpoche doing that over and over again, over the years, consistently. I, I, from Rinpoche, what I learned was that it's okay to stay up very late, it's okay to get very sick, and it's okay to suffer just as long as somebody else doesn't. So, what I learned from that was that even if I don't like somebody, even if I've had a fight with someone, and someone has irritated me, if that person is in trouble, especially if the person is in medical trouble, I'll still help them. It might be very grudgingly, it might be quite reluctantly, but I'll still help them. Because I think that people don't deserve to suffer or be in pain physically, even if I don't like them, <laughs> right? I, you don't have to like someone and you don't have to like, and you don't have to be friends with them in order to help them because nobody deserves to be in pain. That is something that Rinpoche taught me. That is, a, that is the example that Rinpoche gave to me. If that is a quality that you admire about Rinpoche, if that is a quality that has made you respect Rinpoche, that is a quality that is very, very nice and very, very easy for us to impart to our kids. How? Very simple example. Take them to a soup kitchen. Take them to a food bank. Get them from a young age to participate in these activities. So, at the very least, they don't take for granted what it is that they have. And, as a further step to that, they learn that it's okay to suffer, to go without, in order to benefit somebody else. Be supportive of them. That is something that I am also quite thankful for from uh, that I'm grateful for that you know from my parents which was that when I was a kid I had a lot of stupid dreams a lot of stupid dreams there was one point I wanted to be an astronaut 
Then I realized that in order to be an astronaut, you have to be an American citizen. I wanted to work for NASA. Then I realized, then I thought that I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. Then again, I realized that you have to be an American citizen in order to join the Navy SEAL. Then when I was older, I wanted to be uh, a human rights lawyer. Then when I got older, I wanted to be a marine biologist. Every time I came up with a very, what, what would you call a cockamamie idea? My parents never told me that, you know, they never laughed at me. Um, whenever I went on protests or anything like that, my parents never told me to stop. In fact, they were supportive. When I wanted to be a marine biologist, for example, even though my parents were not financially very well off at the time, they still saved up and then took us on a family holiday to Australia so that I could interact with dolphins because it was dolphins that I wanted to, wanted to work with um, as a marine biologist. They sent me, they, they let me go and learn diving because that is something that I would have needed to become a marine biologist. So all these weird ideas, like I, it was never accountant, it was never engineer, it was, you know, it was never the usual suspects. It was something way out in left field. My parents never laughed at me. They always t tried to make that dream happen. They were supportive. They didn't call me dumb. When I was older, um, and I had the great fortune of going on pilgrimage with Rinpoche, we went to Bogaya um, twice. And the first time I went to Bogaya with Rinpoche was with a small group, I think like seven people. And I was, I think, 16 at the time. And I've been watching a lot of a lot of um, travel documentaries like Ian Wright and stuff like that, you know. And I had this idea in my head of becoming a travel writer. This very like romantic notion of becoming a travel writer. So I was sat at the back of the minibus when we were in Sri Lanka and I was scribbling in my journal thinking of like I was some kind of travel writer. And so on the way to the hotel, Rumchi turned around and Rumchi looked at me and Rumchi asked me, what are you doing? And so I told Rumchi, oh Rumchi, I'm, I'm writing, I'm, I'm keeping a diary and a journal about our trip. And instead of, you know, like rolling his eyes or like, like, like you know, like laughing or, or whatever, Rumchi said, oh, keep good notes, keep good records of our trip. Um, you're going to be writing a lot in the future. That was it. So every time I had these weird ideas, I had people around me who thought, okay, let's see how we're going to make this happen. That made a huge impression on me. At the same time, something that I would have really loved to learn from a young age was being taught that it's okay to be wrong. Um, that was not something that my parents were particularly good at teaching me. Um, for example, a common reaction to being told they are wrong is that my parents would react very angrily. So the more angry they are, the more scared I am, so the more I shut up because I told them that they are wrong. Um, another reaction to them being told that they are wrong is that they would laugh and avoid the subject or not talk about it because they did not want people to know that someone else knows more than them. Thankfully, I had Rinpoche to show me that it's okay to be wrong. Rinpoche was a perfect example of this and it was something that Rinpoche drove into my head over and over again that it's okay to be wrong. And oh, thankfully, I've gotten a little bit better at it over the years. Rinpoche said that no one will be 100% right 100% of the time. And Rinpoche always said that when you are okay with being wrong, you take the power away from other people to laugh at you. You take away the power from other people to reignite that trauma that you may have experienced as a child. That deep aversion to being shown that you are wrong, you take the power away from other people. You help to de-escalate de situations with a sentence that is simple as, I'm so sorry I messed up. What can I do to make it better? So, this is a quality that I would have very much liked to have learned when I was younger, um, that caused a lot of suffering to myself, made me very, very hard on myself and beat myself up each time I make a mistake.
how was it that Rinpoche was able to come to the conclusion that it's okay to be wrong? Because Rinpoche told us that he himself had gone through the same experience as a child. That when Rinpoche got things wrong as a child, Rinpoche's mother would beat and abuse Rinpoche. And so Rinpoche became very, very sensitive to getting things right. And that Rinpoche, as Rinpoche grew older, Rinpoche realised that that was not the way, that was not the most beneficial way of interacting with other people. That that kind of hypersensitivity would lead to a lot of suffering for ourselves and to others. And so Rinpoche was very clear and emphasised very often that it's okay to be wrong. Learn to be okay. Learn to be okay with being wrong. I know that as adults, it's hard sometimes to admit that we're wrong. But the thing is, children see that. Children pick that up. That is something that children pick up. And sometimes when you find that it's so difficult to admit that you're wrong, invariably what happens, without meaning to be, is that we tend to move towards the side of deception. We start to do things to cover up the fact that we got things wrong. So that initial small seed of not being okay and being wrong then escalates into something more. It, escal it could escalate into lying. It could escalate into dishonesty. It could escalate into deception. It could escalate to getting involved in something that becomes such a huge big deal that we have no choice but to go along with it because we can't face ourselves, we can't face the ridicule we, th we imagine that we might experience if we were to admit that we were wrong and pull out of it. Don't you know people, for example, who get involved in business schemes and business projects, who invest so much money in it, and even though everyone can see that it's going very, very badly, that it's such a bad idea to invest in this thing, this person keeps insisting on throwing more money into it. And they cannot imagine and they cannot understand why everyone is telling them that it's a completely bad idea. Why? Because the person who's investing in it, unfortunately, has a lot of trouble with realising that it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to admit that you have made a mistake. That is one <laughs> very, I guess, relevant way, example, that we may find, even if we don't have children, that we may find that if we have an inability to admit that we're wrong, can be very damaging to our personal lives. All right, something that, um, something else that Ramishi often talked about that is very important in being there for children in the right way is teaching them to value other things. For example, oh, this one, <laughs> this one I think a lot of people um, will be familiar with. Um, unhelpful comments that we, without thinking, make to especially young, younger people, young adults or children. Things like, wow, your life is really prosperous, huh? Wow, life has been very good, huh? What is that quote for in Asian culture? Come on. I know you guys know this. When someone comes up to you doing Chai Zia and tells you, wow, life has been very good to you, huh? What do they mean? What they're trying to tell you is that you've put on weight that you got fat, that um, you're bloated, that you don't look as good as you did. The flip side of that is saying that if you're skinny, you look attractive, you look good. What child, what eight-year-old needs to hear that? What eight-year-old needs to be told that they're fat? Okay, so even today, um, when I hear things like, wow, when he was skinny and handsome, Putting those two words together, skinny and handsome, I'm like, mm. right. So there are a lot of situations, culturally, socially speaking, we don't realize it where we make comments that impress on other people that looks and the way that we look is far more important than everything else in life. Why do we make those remarks? We make those remarks because that's what's important to us because that is what we notice, because it's important to us. And so when we talk about it over and over again, and we emphasize it, that then becomes something else that that other person finds must be important. If we keep telling someone who is young, 
wow, that person is so skinny and successful. What is that, ch- what is that child going to think? That in order to be successful, one of the markers of success is being skinny. That to be considered beautiful, one of the markers of beauty is being skinny. So, it teaches someone else to focus on looks. It teaches someone else to focus on the external. What Rimshi always taught us was that we should focus more on qualities than on looks. Don't let children learn that looks, that money, that fame, that popularity are important. Teach them to focus on something other than looks. Why is it important for us to do that? Why is it important for any of us to learn and understand that qualities are more important, developing certain qualities are more important than focusing and emphasizing on looks and money and all that? Because money, fame, beauty, youth, the value of all those things goes up and down. With money, with wealth, inflation, deflation. There's a possibility that you may not be able to keep it. With beauty and youth, aging, okay, time. With popularity, maybe suddenly one day you're not on trend, in trend anymore. What you're wearing isn't in trend anymore. And so you're always chasing for the next trend. So these things are always going up and down in value. These things are always changing and impermanent. But look, just look at the people who you find to be happy and the people who you find to be content and the people who you find to be satisfied. Just look at, look at monks, for example, old monks. Okay? Old monks who are practiced don't even comment on these things. They don't even make a remark on it. They don't even talk about how that skinny monk who was walking there or that fat monk who was walking there or that rich monk who was walking there or that poor monk. They don't, they don't even comment on it. Why? Because these qualities... Or, sorry, these aspects, these characteristics are not what is important to them. The f- because it's not even important to them, it doesn't even cross their mind to even observe it, to even comment on it. If we already struggle, and we have already struggled in our lives, because we were taught from young to, to focus on beauty, on looks, on wealth, on money, on popularity, on being, pop- on being in trend and so on, if we already struggled and suffered in our lives, chasing all these things, why would we want to transmit and teach the same lessons to our kids? All right, so what I always saw Rimichi doing, especially with young children, especially with young adults, was instead of focusing on commenting on these things, which was never important to Rimichi anyway, Rimichi would always comment on their qualities. When they were kind to someone, Rimichi would say, good job, you are such a kind person. When Rimichi saw someone um, speaking up or defending, let's say a, a sick dog, you know, who is being abused, Rimichi would say, good job. Thank you so much for taking care of that sick animal. You're such a kind person. So we can do it. If you have children, you can do it. You can, you can say things like, oh, you're very kind to your friend today. I'm so proud of you. Or, good job for standing up for your friend today who was being bullied. Or, thank you for being so responsible and taking care of your brother. Things like that. Focusing on qualities, on what a Buddhist would call attainments, on positive actions, on positive behaviours, rather than on looks and on money and things like that. Why? Because when we do that, we are making the development of these qualities important in someone's mind by praising these qualities because looks will fade, trends will fade, relationships will fade, attraction will fade, people get bored with their partners, popularity will fade, fame will fade. All of these things will fade, but the qualities that we develop will not. What is another word for qualities? Another word for qualities in a very Buddhist sense is attainments. There are higher ultimate qualities which are called attainments which we can develop. For example, compassion. For example, renunciation. For example, wisdom. And so if we keep praising these qualities or behaviours and actions and decisions that somebody makes in the process of developing these qualities, 
it's encouraging the person to continue with it. It's emphasizing to them the importance of developing these qualities and instead of focusing on other things. All right. By doing this, we show other people that it's okay to pursue something different. So, how can we do that? Liu shared some, some tips before, um, for example. Um, and these are some tips that Rinpoche has always talked about, especially to parents. If you want to go on a holiday, go on a pilgrimage. If you have a school holiday, if you're on a break, instead of shopping every single weekend, instead of going to eat every single weekend, maybe let your child go somewhere and volunteer somewhere. An animal shelter, uh, an animal refuge, an orphanage, an old folks home, a food bank, a soup kitchen. So in, during school holidays, instead of shopping, 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 eat, 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 maybe shop, shop, volunteer, eat, eat, help somewhere, um, play, play, go to temple. All right, so if you see a stray animal, be the parent who stops to feed the animal. Be the parent who goes to buy food to give to the animal. Show your children that it's okay to pursue something different. That when you recognize somebody else suffering, that it's okay to reach out to them. All right, very simple ways. Remember that for everyone, whether you're young or old, or whether even your child is young or old, um, the best way to show somebody that something is good to do is to show them by example. Especially when a child is young, they look to an older person, they look to a guardian, to a parent, to a mentor, to see if something is okay to do or not. All right, so if you keep showing this young person that you are in charge of, that you're responsible for, that it's okay to be different, that it's okay to pursue different things, that it's okay to respond to anger with kindness. That is the example that they're going to pick up and that's the example that they're going to learn and that's the example that they're going to share with other people. So if we are dissatisfied with how our lives have turned out, if we are not content, if we have suffered, why are we constantly engaging in the same behaviours um, and thereby creating the causes for our children to lead the same kind of suffering, to experience the same kind of suffering that we have had that we have experienced ourselves. There's, okay, there's one more point that I want to bring up. Actually, two more points I want to bring up, which I thought of when I was on a, ironically on a bike ride the other day. Um, which then was emphasized, re-emphasized to me um, in a teaching that was recently published on Rimushi's Facebook fan page. The teaching was, um, is money the result of good karma? The first point I want to bring up is that it's okay to let a child struggle. When Rimichi talked about this, um, Rimichi talked about it in the sense of what, what is known as the maid syndrome and how the maid syndrome um, leads children to become complacent adults um, and leads children to be growing up to become adults who are unable to tolerate difficulties excuse me, and who give up very easily and who are unable to do things for themselves. When someone, when, when we talk about the maid syndrome, we're not talking necessarily about having a domestic helper in your house because obviously not all families are in a position to be able to afford to have a domestic helper at home or to have a nanny at home and so on. Maid syndrome can also apply, for example, to parents who are extremely um, kind to a child to the point of coddling them. So the mother who does every single thing for the child just so that the child never has to suffer. I have a very, very good example of this from my own childhood. So, when my sister was, I think, I think in year four, primary four, um, she was having difficulty in, in school. Maybe she was four years old. Either one. Um, she was having difficulty in school um, and not getting along or struggling in class, especially with the teacher. So my, my mother um, was very worked up about this when she heard about my sister um, not enjoying school. So my, ma my mother marched into school and then gave the teacher peace of her mind and um, told the teacher off and told the teacher um, 
and, and wanted to make arrangements for my sister to be pulled out of that classroom and be put into another class. When my mother came home and relayed this story to my dad, apparently my dad argued with my mother and said my mother should not have done that. My mother said to my sister, uh, to my, my father said to my mother that she should stop trying to solve all of our problems for us. She should stop trying to get involved in the situation and make life easy for us. My father told my mother that if you love your kids and you don't want them to suffer, the best way of making sure that they don't suffer is to make sure that when they are young, they learn to do things for themselves so that when they are old, they don't suffer. So if you really love your child, and Rumi said this over and over again, if you really love your child and you don't want to suffer, let them learn how to do things for themselves because if you keep rescuing your child, how will they ever learn? If you keep doing things for your child, how will they ever learn? So my dad told my mother, if you keep rescuing Jin Mei over and over again, each time she runs into difficulties, if you keep stepping in to resolve the situation for her, how is she ever going to learn to do things for herself? What is going to happen when she gets older and things are difficult? How will she learn to fend for herself? So, as an extension to that, what Rumishi also told us was, yes, let your child experience some suffering. Suffering. As a parent, it might hurt you to see a child struggling now, but Rumishi said, be there for them in the right way. Support them. Let them know that if all things, if everything goes wrong, you are there for them. Give them advice, give them guidance, but let them work it out for themselves. If they really, really can't do it, let them know that you'll be there for them. But let them go through it themselves. When Rumishi talked about this, it was also in relations to the relationship between a guru and a teacher, a, a guru and a student, excuse me. Rumishi talked about the importance of having a guru that you can trust. Why? After you've observed your teacher, as per the 50 stanzas of Guru Devotion, after you've taken refuge in your teacher, as per the 50 stanzas of Guru Devotion, surrender completely to your teacher. Why is it important to surrender completely to your teacher? Because your teacher will never ever give you something that you can't handle. Your teacher will never ever give you something that you will fail at. And even if you do fail, if you've tried really, 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 really hard, your teacher will still be there to catch you and you will still have learned something just by applying sincere effort and by trying. Since our Guru is there with us to catch us when we fall, why not surrender and go all the way? Why not have full faith and trust in our teacher and commit all the way and go all the way with it? So, going backwards, the same thing applies for a parent and the child. Whilst, we, whilst the parent is still alive, Rumji said, whilst the child still has a safety net, why not let the child keep making mistakes and keep suffering so that when they're older, they don't make the same mistakes then? Whilst you're still alive as a parent, why not be there for them, watch them, guide them, protect them, advise them, direct them, but, and let them know that if things go wrong, you'll be there to help them. Let them explore, let them suffer, let them learn. There are so many people I know today, I can tell you, who don't know how to cook for themselves. Like in their mid-twenties, late-twenties, don't know how to boil, don't know how to boil water. Like, don't know how the toaster works, don't know how a kettle works. That's a very, very simple example of how someone from a very young age has had everything done for them. So, if a person doesn't know how to operate a washing machine, doesn't know how to check if food is ripe or rotten, doesn't know how to boil water, if it's for something as low level as that, how will they ever be able to handle things if things go wrong in a much bigger way? Okay? So, that point, pen penultimate point that I wanted to bring up was let, let, let a child suffer with the caveat that 
you will be there for them if things go wrong. Why? Because if you truly love them and you don't want them to suffer in the future, let them learn the mistakes now so that they don't repeat the same mistakes in, in the future. The final point that I do want to bring up before we end for the year, I know I've totally run over time, but it's fine. Last one. Um, is, and I learned this from Rinpoche, was stand up for other people and do the right thing, no matter how hard it is. I can tell you for this one, personally, I've never had a problem with, and in fact, my issue is shutting up. And uh, <laughs> my issue is actually the opposite. Lah, okay? It's shutting up and learning to not always say things because people are not necessarily ready to hear it. But it was something that Rumchi always encouraged me every time there was an opportunity. If I see something wrong, speak up. Don't stay quiet. Why? Because if you stay quiet, someone else may suffer as a result. Rumchi showed me that by example, by speech and by example, that even if you have to suffer for the sake of someone else's benefit, do it and be happy to suffer. Be happy to absorb the suffering. Be happy to be the one to be criticized. Be happy to be the one who is accused because someone else will benefit from it. So even if people hate you for speaking up, speak up. Don't stay silent if you see something happening because you want to save face. Is your face worth someone else's suffering? This doesn't apply just to you know, our adult relations, but it applies to our children too. When you are trying to change things, when you're trying to apply a discipline, for example, when you're trying to apply guidelines, when you're trying to apply rules, is it possible that your kids will look at you one kind? Is it possible that your kids will say very hurtful things to you? Is it possible that your kids will react to you and say, I hate you so much. Why do you make my life so difficult? Why do you let me suffer? Why? Why don't you get me this thing? Why are you making me work for it? Why do I have to save up? Why don't you just buy it for me? Aren't you earning money? Will your kids react to you that way? Yeah. You know what? Your kids will most likely, most likely react to you in that way. But would you rather let them off the hook now and then go and buy them that PS5 if it's available now without them working for it? And then teach them the lesson that you can get things without having to work for it. And so they suffer later. Or would you rather tahan all these hurtful things that they do, they're saying to you now so that they don't suffer in the future? When your child tells you that they hate you, when your child goes around complaining to all of their friends or to other parents and say, oh my God, my parents are so stingy. They never, give it, never buy this for me, never buy that for me and so on. They never take me anywhere. Yeah, of course, you lose face. But is saving your face worth your child suffering later. The example that all of us are familiar with, whether we are children or not, about how it's, we should speak up when we see that things are going wrong and we shouldn't just work to save face is the Doji Shukdim ban and how much of Rimichi's personal wishes had to be given up in order to speak up against the ban on Doji Shukdim practice. Rumichi loved the monastery. Rumichi loved his gurus. And Rumichi said that, <clears throat> excuse me, Rumichi said that the only place that Rumichi ever felt truly at home was in the monastery. <sighs> Sorry. Rumichi said that because of speaking up for the benefit of so many people in order to receive Toju Shukim practice. Excuse me. Rumichi was never able to go back to the monastery again. When Rumichi's teachers passed into Para Nirvana, Rumichi wasn't able to go back for the ceremonies. Why? Because if Rumichi had gone back to the monastery, Rumichi would have been forced to swear out the practice. Rumichi couldn't risk that because by swearing out the practice, Rumichi would be breaking 
his promise to His Holiness Kyabji Song Rinpoche to always continue the practice of Doji Shukden. So Rinpoche couldn't go back. When Rinpoche started speaking up against the ban on Doji Shukden, Rinpoche couldn't go back because Rinpoche's life was in danger. So Rinpoche gave up so much... <sighs> Sorry. Rinpoche gave up so much of his personal wishes and personal aspirations in order to speak up for something that Rimshi saw happening that was creating a lot of suffering for many people, which was the ban on Doji Shukden. Rimshi knew that if there was a voice and that there were many vo more voices speaking up against the ban, it would allow so many more people to connect with Doji Shukden and to benefit from this connection with Doji Shukden. So, Rinpoche gave up his own personal wishes in order to do that. Alright, so, that is an example that all of us can see very, very clearly that when you see something happening that is not right, stand up and do the right thing. Speak up and don't stay silent. When you see, it applies to kids, right? When you see your child going down a path that you know will lead them to more suffering in the future. Stand up to that situation and no matter how hard it is for yourself, apply the teachings that you have received from our Guru. Apply it, take a stand, make a decision to be different so that although you admit that you are, are, you are admitting that you are wrong, although you are admitting that you have made decisions and acted in a way that may have created harm in the past and therefore you lose face, shame, shame. You're not going to do that anymore. You're going to do something different and you're going to speak up to a situation that you see is going very, very wrong to prevent somebody else's suffering in the future. Alright? So, is it going to be easy? No. Because you're undoing not just 30, 40 years of habituation, you're undoing lifetimes of your own habit. Are you going to slip from time to time? Of course, you're going to slip. You're not going to not make mistakes. Just because you're a parent does not mean that you have to appear to be fallible, you have to appear to be perfect, that you have to appear to be flawless. You're human, you're allowed to make mistakes. But are your kids worth the effort? Is your own spiritual practice worth the effort? Remember when I talked earlier about the benefits of applying what it is that Rinpoche has advised us on how to be there for children the right way and the benefits of applying the Dharma and transforming. It's for your kids, it's also for yourself because you end up becoming a nicer person. So, are your children worth the effort? Are your children worth the struggle? Are your children worth you taking the time now to admit, I made mistakes in the past, I'm going to do something different in the future? Is your children worth that? Is your spiritual practice worth that? Yes. And then you might be thinking, well, Pastor Jinai, my kids are already grown up, my kids are already adults. How is any of this going to make a difference? <sighs> of course it's going to make a difference. Are your children not adults of their own? Are your children not adults with their own set of eyes and their own set of ears and their own mouth and their own mind? Can your children not observe things for themselves? Your children will see transformation in you if you apply the Dharma and put it into practice. How do you convince someone else that Dharma is good? How do you convince someone else that <coughs> mom and dad haven't gone completely off the reservation or completely lost the plot or gone mad? How do you convince someone that Dharma is good? You can tell them all the time, Dharma is good, Dharma is good, you should practice Dharma, you should be kind, you should be compassionate, you should do this, you should do that, you should be kind to your brother, you should share, you should, you should be generous. But if the kids turn around and they see that their parents are being hypocritical, they are not sharing, they are not being generous, they are not being kind, they are not reacting to somebody else's anger in a kind way. If children see that, then how is an adult child going to understand or believe that Dharma is good? The only way that an adult child is going to understand or believe that Dharma is good is by seeing the parent transform. The only way that you, as a spiritual practitioner, is ever going to be able to convince somebody that Dharma is good that Dharma can help, that Dharma is beneficial, is by your own transformation. A parent can transform for a child. A child 
can transform for their parent. A human can transform for a human. Okay? It's not about age. It's not about what role or position you fit in. It's about how much suffering, how much less suffering rather, you want to create for someone else and for the people around you. All right? So, with this, I'm going to end. Um, this, as I mentioned at the beginning of the sharing, um, is the last of 28 weeks or 7 months of sharings. And I do hope that you guys have found something um, useful. We are, as I mentioned, going to resume in the new year. Um, but in the meantime, if you guys have ideas for content, if you guys have ideas for topics, for subjects, for questions, for format, um, send us a message on Facebook um, to the Kachara fan page and let us know what you want to see. Let us know what um, topics you want us to cover and so on. Uh, and let's see what any questions before I say bye for the holidays. Um, yeah. There's like 27, uh, yeah, 28 weeks worth of videos. So um, I might not be talking next week, but doesn't mean that you can't go back to week one and listen to week one's video, all right? So um, yeah, take the time to maybe revisit the videos um, until we resume with a formal timetable, I guess. All right, um, just a quick reminder before I go. Um, upcoming programs for today, Doju Shukne Sadhana on the Chinese Kachara Facebook fan page at 10 p.m. Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Easy Dharma for the New Normal with Pastor Nero. Pastor Nero. Um, Thursday at 8 p.m. on the Kacharians and Friends Facebook group. There is the Tsen Rinpoche Swift Return Puja. And then on Thursday at 10 p.m. on the Tsen Rinpoche Paranormal Zone page um, is GP and Nikim's Paranormal Sharing. All right, so thank you guys so much for joining me today and for sticking with me for the last seven months. I can't believe it's been seven months. Um, I'm so excited for 2021. All right. Um, if you guys have any requests or for offerings or prayers or dedications, um, please leave me a message here and I'll get on that. And don't forget to do your dedications as usual. And uh, again, thank you so much to the sponsors of today's sharing and for the past 28 weeks of sharing. Thank you so, so much. Um, just because we are not running the programs as regularly, we will still be running them in the future. So it does not mean that you don't have opportunity opportunity rather to contribute. You can still contribute. And there's a link to that in the description section of this video. All right. So again, thank you guys so much. Um, and I wish I could say see you same time, same place next week, but I'll see you in 2021. All right. Um, take care. Have a wonderful holiday. And um, don't forget to be kind to each other. All right. Bye, guys.